this, I think we must examine the psychology of intuition. And that is what I'll try to do with the remainder of my time. OK. Let me begin by describing two kinds of thinking. This is one way that thoughts come to mind. And now let me show you another way that thought come to mind. Now, let's compare what happened in those two cases. What's happening here? Well, the product of 17 times 24, you could get to it, you know, unless you spent a lot of your youth, misspent a lot of your youth with multiplication table. <laughs> That's something that you had to generate according to a rule. So, and this is a slow, effortful process. Detecting that this woman is angry, although it's something that we would call an intuition, actually. But that impression simply comes to mind. She looks angry just as she looks dark-haired. And we have predictions about what her voice will sound like if she speaks. We may have predictions about what she's going to say when uh, she speaks, certainly if we know who she's talking to. Now, as you can see in this example, I'll call this intuitive thinking. It's a very primitive example. It's a very simple example of intuitive thinking, but it is an example. And it feels like something that happens to us. It doesn't feel like something we do. So the experience of intuitive thinking is very much like the experience of seeing, of perceiving the world. And indeed, it is very hard to tell the, to find a line that separates seeing from interpreting rather complicated things such as the mood of an individual. Now, a lot of psychological theorizing has gone into in, to describing those two ways of thinking. And as one of those simplifications that theorists sometimes engage in, we, we now often speak about two systems of thought. Or there are two, two systems or two processes. It's a simplification, but it's, I think, a very useful simplification. And, and we talk of two modes of thinking or two families of thought processes. Sometimes, and I'll slip into that, I'll talk about intuition versus reasoning, but I prefer the rather neutral label, system one, which is the intuitive system, and system two, which is the other system. And system one is the one that detected that this lady was angry, and it clearly operates extremely quickly. Although in some cases, intuitions can develop slowly, but the characteristic of system one is very high speed. System two is slow. The other aspect of it is that you didn't really have a choice in seeing that woman as angry. You had a choice about whether or not to compute 17 times 24. I think very few of you actually did. Uh, so, you know, you just didn't do it, and then nothing happened. But, but you didn't have to do anything in order to see the woman as angry. So one mechanism is automatic, and the other is voluntary. It happens if you want it to happen. You can start and end without finishing. You can stop in the middle. So it's control as against automatic. Now, there are many computations, mental computations, that have this character, that they are performed automatically. Amos Tversky and I call them natural assessments. And you know, when you look around you, you make a lot of these natural assessments. Uh, you perceive objects around you, you identify them, you know how far they are from you, you know how loud they are, you know their color. You don't have to think about any of this. These are all computations, and some of them are quite complex. But these are computations that the mind performs and just delivers the results to our consciousness without our being aware that we're engaging in any activity. But there are natural assessments which are conceptual. So, you know, if, if I mention, it's an old example, as you'll see. So if I mention that Woody Allen parents actually wanted him to be a dentist. Now, a few years ago, this would have brought some laughter, actually. Woody Allen is no longer quite as important a figure as he was. But whatever Woody Allen is, when you hear that sentence, if you know, you know, 
if you know about Woody Allen, you know that he's not going to be a very good dentist. <laughs> and, the, and that computation is performed immediately and automatically. That is, we have those two com components of the sentence, and we, we perform an operation that links them and compares them and comes out with a result, this is a good fit, this is not a good fit. And in some cases, a fit that is not good in a particular way will bring a smile. There are many conceptual analyses that we perform you know, on, on what we hear and what we see without actually intending to do so. We are constantly on the lookout for causal connections. So if we see, if we hear and see events that are related in particular ways, we look for cause and effect, and we do that automatically. We evaluate similarity, as in the Woody Allen and dentist case. We evaluate familiarity and surprise. And very importantly, we evaluate emotion. That is, we have an ongoing evaluation emotional evaluation of the world as good or bad, threatening or benign, that goes on automatically. And we can prove that it goes, goes on automatically. But not everything gets computed. So there are certain aspects of the environment that don't get computed. Uh, for example, if we show this for a fraction of a second, you will, you will have seen or would have seen in a fraction of a second several things. You would have seen that two of these objects are more similar to each other than they are to the third one. Uh, and here is something you wouldn't have seen. You would not have seen that there is the same number of blocks in figure 2b as in figure 2a. So, you know, it's there. And, you know, for a computer, if you programmed a computer to do this, it would be no trick at all to take that information and it would be there. Or that you could construct a tower, that if you constructed a tower from the blocks on 2B, it would be as tall as the tower of 2A. We don't compute that. So we don't compute everything that we could. And that is, it turns out, quite important. So here is a set of lines. It's actually, and now here is a computation that it turns out from recent research, actually, uh, by Anne Treisman and my wife, in, among others, it turns out there is a computation that everybody performs instantly and effortlessly. And that computation is you get an impression of the average length of the lines in this display. You get that for free. You don't have to work at it. You can do this while thinking of something else. It's a computation that the mind is set to perform. But now there is something else that you could ask about and that we don't compute. What is the total length of the lines in this display? You have no idea. You can do it, but system two will have to do it. That is, you can estimate the average length, you can assess or in fact get an impression of the number of lines, and then you can multiply. Again, you know, actually, if a computer were programmed to do this, the computer would take the sum as a, on, on its way to getting the average. It turns out we have machinery that can compute the average, but we don't know the sum. If we want to have the sum, we need to compute it. That turns out to be quite important, this distinction between assessments that are natural and assessments that are not natural uh, and that need to be performed by system two. That is an important distinction that we'll get back to. Now, let me show you another example of what we call the automaticity of operations of system one. What you have to do here is, and you know, you can humor me, you can say it aloud. I'm going to show you some objects and say the color of the objects in the following slides. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, this is one of the most the classic experiments in psychology. You had no control over what happened to you here. That is, the reading was automatic, and, and reading, it turns out, is, comes, you know, calling out the colors 
was not hard, but it's not something that comes very, very easily. There is a little more effort in calling out the colors than in reading. When you present the two, the reading comes out automatically and it preempts the response. So that's an example of an automatic uh, response. So here is another characteristic of uh, those two systems. You can come to the Heathrow Airport in London and you want to rent a car and they give you a keys, the keys and they tell you please rem remember that we drive on the left here. And you do mostly, I mean if you're not very tired or if uh, you can do it. That, that ability to adopt a rule and follow it, that is a system to operation. We can reset ourselves. System one, which is automatic, is much harder to control. And indeed, when you get very busy and very preoccupied, you may find yourself driving on the wrong side in, in London because you're not, well, not in London, but, but on, a, on a highway, uh, because you're not actually monitoring closely enough what is going on. Now, so system two is a very quick study. System two can adopt an instruction and obey, but it is slow in, in, slow in execution. System one is a slow learner, but it's fast in execution. So what we call associations between ideas are hard to learn and hard to unlearn. Now this has important Im implications for skill because skilled operations the operations of, you know, what happens with basketball players and, and with chess players, is skilled performance migrates from system two to system one. It begins as a system two operation, and it eventually, when you become skilled, you no longer have the scaffold of remembering the rules. You just do it. Okay. Now, another characteristic of these two modes of thinking. And I've already mentioned it. Intuition is effortless, like perception. Reasoning or system two operations are effortful. What do we mean by effortless and effortful? As psychologists, we mean a very simple thing. Mostly, we mean that if an operation is effortful, it will interfere with other operations that are effortful. We have a limited ability to do two difficult things at once. And if we try to do two difficult things at once, performance will suffer, which is not true when we're dealing with system one operations. So that is uh, one of the characteristics of system one. It is effortless. System two is effortful. And there is an important function of system two, which this example will show. So you can follow along. A bat and a ball together cost $1.10. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, let me make a prediction. Every one of you, I would think, has thought of a number, and the number is 10 cents. That's been in everybody's mind. Now, that makes the problem interesting, because 10 cents is false. You know, if, if it were 10 cents, and you, and, then the bat would be a dollar more, it would be a dollar ten, and a dollar ten and ten cents would be a dollar twenty, so ten cents is not the answer. But now, what is interesting is when you put that question to Princeton students, half of them say ten cents. Now, and they do even when you give them time. And, <laughs> and they don't when you frighten them. Uh, that is, you know, when they're really worried about making a mistake, they don't. But otherwise they do. Uh, you know, even 45% of students at MIT make the mistakes. So what, what we learn about people who make this mistake is that they haven't checked. One of the functions of system two is to monitor system one. That is, we don't say everything that comes to mind, we say only a fraction of what comes to our mind, sometimes too much, but, but we do monitor ourselves. The monitoring, however, is very casual. And this example illustrates how casual the monitoring is. It illustrates you know, that 
Well, you know, that number comes to mind and it looks plausible, and it is plausible. It's about $1 less, and out it goes. That is, it turns out, very important. And if you keep people busy, if you, for example, load their memory with stuff so that they have to remember a seven-digit number while doing something else, then I wouldn't say that their behavior collapses, but their behavior changes in an interesting way. So, for example, they will become much less politically correct. So, people who are holding a seven-digit number in their head use words that are not quite so nice. They use lady, they use girl, uh, whereas, you know, otherwise they would use woman and, and sort of be more, more attuned to with what they're supposed to do. People who hold a seven-digit number in their head are more selfish than if they don't. So system two does monitor system one, and when you interfere with the ability of system two to monitor system one, performance changes. This, there are shades of Freudian psychology here, but this is the modern version of Freudian psychology. Now, and finally, associative versus rule govern. That is, and I'll illustrate in a minute what I mean by, by associative. But I want to describe the mind as a machine for jumping to conclusions. This is when we get very fast answers to complicated questions. We're jumping to conclusions. And that is a very important function of the mind. And whether we do it skillfully or not is a separate question, whether we do it accurately or not. But it's important that this is what we do. Let me illustrate that. OK. Let me tell you a few of the things that happened to you uh, within a second or two of my showing this word. And every one of the things that I'm going to say has been confirmed in research. So it is actually a fact that all those things happened to you. A lot happened, actually. Now, you couldn't help reading the word. So you had no control, of course. You read the word. Now, your mind was probably, there were images that came to your mind. Images and memories. I can predict that they were not pleasant. Uh, now, your body reacted. Your pupils dilated. Your heart quickened. Your, uh, you know, sweat, you sweated a bit. You know, all this very weak, but all of this has been confirmed. I mean, this is part of the reaction to this word. More than that, we could have measured your face and it twisted a bit in an expression of disgust. If we took a picture of the faces in the audience, within a second or two of this word, there would have been disgust. There is more. You recoiled. There is evidence that people's body, that their posture, reacts and is different. When a word that is shown is pleasant or unpleasant, we approach pleasant words, we recoil from unpleasant words. And there is evidence that this too happens. You became more alert and more vigilant than usual. And, and then, if we presented words in a whisper and asked you to recognize them, there is a whole set of words to which you, would have, you are now, you probably still are, unusually sensitive. Uh, words like smell, stink, sick, nausea. All of these words, a whole cluster of words, you are now prepared to recognize more than you were before. This is an incomplete list of what happened to you, and it illustrates one of the basic mechanisms of system one. That's the spreading of ideas in a network of associations. And the impressive aspect of all this complex of reactions that happened to you within a second or two is its coherence. I mean, this is not an accidental grouping of reactions. It all makes sense your reaction to that single word. Now, the connections between the elements of this complex of reactions are not necessarily logical, but ideas that have been correlated in experience facilitate each other. Now, this mechanism of coherence and prepares you for things, and, and it evaluates surprises. And I, I can't help but tell you a story of how this, how the system works. Well, some years ago, uh, we were 
spending vacation on a resort island on the, on the Barrier Reef next to, Australia, next to Australia. It's a small resort. There are 40 rooms in that resort. And we went to dinner the first evening, and lo and behold, there was a psychologist I know who's at Stanford. And we were both really quite surprised. You know, fancy meeting you here. And uh, that sounded like a coincidence. And then two weeks later, we were in London going to the theater. And you know, we, the theater was dark. Somebody sat to me next to me. And I didn't see who it was until the lights came up during the intermission. And it was the same person. <laughs> and the thing I want to point out is I was less surprised the second time than the first. Because you know what, what I computed immediately was, oh, oh, that's Krosnick. Oh, I meet him all over the place. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the point is we create those associations very, very quickly. We create, we're ready to form expectations very quickly. This is part of, the, of this mechanism, of this associative mechanism. And you know, sometimes it will work better than at other times. Now, this system guides interpretations. So let me show you how this works. Now, you can read that silently, and you know what that is. And you can read that, and you know what that is. And of course, the B and the 13 are physically identical. I mean, it's the same object. But you were not aware of this. The context determined how you read the words. And you were not aware that there was ambiguity. You were not aware that you had suppressed the ambiguity. You were not aware that there was another way of seeing what you saw. The way the system works, it suppresses ambiguity. Doubt and ambiguity is mostly a function of system two. System one doesn't have much doubts. It makes choices. And it delivers to our conscious experience the choices that it has made. And we're not aware of having made the choice. Well, many of you are familiar with this object, which tells us you can see it in two ways. I, think. I guess all of you are familiar with this object. But the important thing is you don't see it in two ways at once. You see it in one way. A choice is made. There are two interpretations, and in this case, they alternate. So those are some properties of the system. This associative machinery has incredible richness and subtlety. That is, the feats of intuition that we see uh, attest to the subtlety of our mental models. I mean, you know, if, if I can ask you who is more likely to play bridge and who is more likely to play poker, a Wall Street banker or an English professor? Now, most of you know the answer. There is an answer in the culture. We, we would expect the Wall Street banker to play poker and the, and the professor to play bridge if this is what they do. There's consensus on answers of this type. It's all part of the mental model. It is probably not a question you have ever asked yourself before. But through the network of associations that in this case is widely shared within a culture, we can come up with answers to such to an infinite number of such questions in you know, the twinkle of an eye, literally, in a blink, as Malcolm Dudwell would say. We're not prepared to ask how skills are acquired. Skill activities that can be performed automatically are acquired through an enormous amount of practice. Uh, for, to acquire, to become a chess master, the estimate is that it takes 10,000 hours of practice, and about the same estimate to become a very good violinist. Uh, it is estimated that learning chess, that the chess master has acquired somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 discrete configurations of pieces that are meaningful, and that by putting together these elements, uh, the chess master is able to construct a representation of the situation. But practice is not enough. What is needed for the acquisition of skill is appropriate feedback. And it's feedback of success and failure in general. And the feedback must be immediate and unequivocal. If the feedback is very delayed or ambiguous, then learning 
is retarded or doesn't occur at all. Now, there are some kinds of situations in learning where feedback is not essential. An example is the learning of threat. So you can, you know, a child does not have to be burned by fire to acquire a fear of fire or a fear of crossing the street. So we can condition and teach emotions, and this is part of the learning of skill. And now I think we may begin to see why stock pickers and CIA analysts do not have the opportunity to develop skills, or at least skills that are much superior to those of lay people. The feedback that they get on their guesses, on their impressions, on their judgments is neither immediate nor unequivocal. The feedback is very much delayed. The system that they're dealing with are extremely complicated. And especially, there is actually no feedback, no immediate feedback. And because of that, there are no opportunities to develop the same kinds of skills that firefighters can develop and nurses and chess players. Now, so I've described the machinery of system one and why it can, you know, I've suggested why it can acquire some skills and cannot acquire others. Now, this is really wonderful machinery, but it's also incompatible with a basic requirement of rationality. That is, and now I'm going back to the first of the conversations I mentioned earlier, the conversations with economists. What we find is that in a system like that, which is associatively coherent, the way that you describe outcomes and the way that you describe problems is going to make a great deal of difference to how people respond to them. So if you describe the statistics of medical interventions, like surgery and radiation therapy, it makes a difference whether you say that during the first month after surgery, there is 10% mortality or that survival rate after one month is 90%. The first description is more frightening than the second description because the word mortality is there and the word survival is in the other. And when you have that, indeed physicians, experienced physicians will make different choices between surgery and uh, radiation therapy depending on which of these formulations is adopted. We have no control over that. This is an operation of, that displays associative coherence. You can present the same difference. It used to be legal uh, in the early days of behavioral economics. It was still legal to have two prices at the gas station, a different price for cash and for credit. And you could describe that either as a cash discount or as a credit card surcharge. Now, obviously, one of these descriptions is much more favorable to credit cards than the other. A cash discount we can forego, a surcharge we hate. And it's at that level, extremely powerful response. And there is really no way to combat this. But it is assumed in the theory of the rational agent that this does not occur. So in that sense, the theory of the rational agent, you know, in the argument that psychologists have had with economists, is a non-starter. It, it really does not recognize the way that system one operates. So these are framing, if, uh, framing effects. Then there are other kinds of effects that... Okay, this is a history class quiz. And here it goes. I'll go quickly. Write down the first three numbers of your home phone number. Add 400 to this number. Consider this total to represent a year in the common era. Do you believe that Attila the Hun was defeated in Europe before or after this year? Okay. And now what is your best guess about the year of Attila the Hun's defeat in Europe? Now let me show you the results. Those are the estimates of, that people gave as a function of their telephone number. So the people are, who, whose telephone numbers end with high digits end up with a high estimate of the year of the defeat of Attila the Hun. What is the mechanism here? Well, I've described the mechanism. It's associative coherence. When 
you have that number in mind, and you know, you're asked, is it too high or too low, or you just think about that number, just having that number in mind causes you to bring together associations, whatever, that make this number more plausible. This is just part of the way we work. We, our mind works. We are presented with information. We try to understand it. We, we don't try. System one tries to make sense of it by associative coherence. And so we end up with a different view of history depending on whether our telephone numbers ends with a high number or with a small number. Let me give you another example of this. In different countries in Europe, there are, I think, eight countries where the default option for organ donation is that you donate your organs in case of death in an accident. There are six countries where the default option is not to donate. In all 14 countries, basically what you have to do if you want to do something is to check a box and choose something that is not the default option. What you have here is the proportion of people who donate their organs in the two groups of countries. It's an enormous effect. Now, this is a highly consequential decision. And basically, what people do is they see a default option, they take it. This, by the way, is part of anything that is presented to us, we have a strong tendency to accept. We're enormously suggestible. And that is part of the way that the mind works, and we can be manipulated by setting default options to quite a remarkable degree. Let me just recap and tell you a bit about what I would have said if I was going to waste 10 more minutes of your time, but I won't actually go through it. It turns out that there is a very simple way that we go about jumping to conclusions, and this is by answering a question that is easier than the question we were asked. It's a mechanism that psychologists know as a mechanism of heuristic thinking. You are asked a complicated question, you answer a simpler one. And, and usually that works very well. Very often it works very well. Sometimes it leads you completely astray. But that is a mechanism and we're typically not aware that we're doing this. So let me just show you one picture. Okay, and the question here is, what is the size of the figures on the screen? Now, they're of equal size. Now, they don't look as if they're of equal size. They just, you know, one of them looks larger than the other two. What do we do? What's happening here? Well, when we look at this object, we see a three-dimensional scene. Within a three-dimensional scene, the most distant person is by far taller than the others. So we have an immediate answer to the question of what is the three-dimensional size of these three objects. That's a natural assessment. Now, that's not the question you were asked. The question you were asked was, what is the size on the screen? But there is an answer to an easier question, far easier. It thrusts itself where you don't want it, and that's the one you see. And it turns out that this mechanism is at work all over the place in cognitive operations. And it causes us to, it causes people to have very quick answers to questions that really baffle the experts. And that's typically because people are answering not the question that the experts is trying to answer, but a different and somewhat easier question. So what have I tried to do? I've tried to acquaint you with a way of thinking about intuition which distinguishes two systems in the mind, system one and system two. I've spoken of system one, which is the system, the intuitive system. I think the principal idea that I've proposed is this notion of associative coherence, which explains a great deal of the workings of this, of this mechanism. And, and the other issue that I've raised, not fully satisfactorily answered, is that if we want to understand what skills are acquired and that's what skills are not acquired, we need to look very carefully at the interaction 
between the environmental, the conditions in the environment and the feedback the environment provides and the opportunities for learning in the associative network. Thank you.